I'm Governor Brad Little, and uh, if you're not for the here for the Community Renewal Task Force Academic Career Success, you're in the wrong room. But even if you are in the wrong room, please stay with us. So. Uh, uh, actually, Governor uh, Albert Bryan from the Virgin Islands was, uh, he's the co-chairman with me, uh, but my good friend, Governor Polis from Colorado agreed uh, to sit in his place, and I'm delighted to have my good friend here to help me in this uh, uh, enlightening panel that we're going to have. Uh, Governor Cox asked us to, uh, to do this, and I'm, I'm very interested in it. It really the discussion today really bolts on to the panel, the general panel we had. And for me, it also bolts on to Chairman Murphy's initiative on, on mental health, because one of my issues with public education is a challenge there, but uh, I, I, I don't want to go down that uh, uh, road, but it, it, it does tie to, to my personal goal uh, when I first uh, ran for governor. And that's that. Uh, I was I was governor I was lieutenant governor during the last recession and we had the unfortunate circumstance where we had a lot of kids uh, that were leaving Idaho and I said if I could do one thing and when I hired my cabinet uh, and and my staff I says when you come to a fork in the road and if you create a situation to where our kids are going to want to stay in Idaho uh, that they're they're going to choose to stay in Idaho please uh, please make that choice. And <laughs> we're doing pretty good at it right now. We got about 2.3% unemployment and we're the fastest growing state. So everybody else's kids are wanting to come to Idaho too, but that's a, that's again, another issue, but, uh, but Idaho is a, a, a largely rural state as is uh, Colorado. And so some of these change, some of these challenges uh, are, are a little different than they are with some of our uh, more urban state friends, but, you know, for me, uh, we we've made great investments in education. Uh, I've increased 500 percent our investments in in literacy and early childhood education. And obviously, the pandemic uh, set us back a little bit, but we do have good empirical evidence. We're making uh, we're, we're making great advances there. Uh, we, we rank all our schools relative to literacy. And I'm proud to say that two of my grandkids are in the school with the highest literacy rate in the state, uh, which is, uh, makes, makes a grandfather very proud. Uh, but I, I tell the people of Idaho, uh, we spend half our general fund on K-12. If kids can't read, we're not doing the right thing. Uh, but this panel is talking about the other end of the pipeline, uh, when they come out of the pipeline and and go into the and go into the workplace, and where do we start in the K twelve journey to prepare them to come out on the other end? And we've got some experts here, and Governor Polis uh, uh, has obviously uh, done a lot of great things in Colorado. The one thing, briefly, I'll tell you about the word. I, I hope we're doing right now. It just passed by one vote in the house uh, last Monday. So I've got to rush back and help uh, get it a little further is uh, our uh, launch grants. Every single graduating uh, Idaho student from high school will have available to them $8,500 to get a college degree, an associate's degree, or a, a technical certificate that, that basically adds value. Uh, our go on rate is not what we want it to do. Uh, I, I actually got the original money through on a special session we had last September uh, and uh, we're the details of it are working out right now, but we're really ho hopeful that our launch grants uh, will propel us into the uh, end of a uh, higher workforce. My state board of education has prioritized what they see are the top Two or three jobs. The first one, obviously, is healthcare because of what happened during the pandemic. And the second one, as we also heard in the last panel, you know, are, are cyber jobs. And in both healthcare and cyber, uh, the challenge for my institutions is where to get uh, staff that's qualified and and uh, and uh, available to teach these kids because uh, both of those are good jobs going forward. Uh, so with that, I'll turn it over to Go Governor Polis. 
before we uh, introduce our panelists. Thank you, Governor Little. This panel is a really a, uh, a, a logical follow up to the last one. This one, that one was kind of high level. This kind of just, uh, you know, where the rubber meets the road and, and let's talk uh, policy and and uh, and what's going on. So I'm really excited to participate. I'm filling in, as Governor Little mentioned, for Governor um, Albert Bryan of U.S. Virgin Islands, who was at this uh, conference. He did attend, but he had to return to the Virgin Islands, uh, and they asked me to uh, fill in for him. Um, the subject matter, and a few of you came up to me before this and mentioned this, it's very similar to what I just testified to the House Education and Workforce Committee on this past Tuesday. Uh, namely, it's kind of a consolation of how we prepare people for success, early childhood, K-12, higher education workforce, and just to briefly address each of those, including some Colorado examples. Um, early childhood education, uh, preparing all kids for success. There's also an immediate workforce benefit today in terms of uh, child care, freeing parents up to, who choose to work to be able to work. In Colorado, uh, when I came in, we had half-day kindergarten. We got full-day kindergarten done. And then this fall, we're starting universal preschool. Uh, and so we're very excited. That's free for everybody, obviously optional, uh, but also a big part of uh, preparing kids for success and expanding our workforce, a challenge uh, many states face uh, I was telling Governor Little in Colorado, we have two uh, uh, two uh, job openings for every unemployed person. He said, we got three for not in Idaho. So, um, so um, with regards to K-12, um, obviously, we're all uh, experiencing as a nation uh, decreases in achievement from the pandemic years, uh, a combination of uh, interruptions in, in person education with mental uh, health issues, a um, number of other factors that went into that. Um, many families experiencing loss of life and aunt and uncle, a grandparent, sometimes a father or mother due to the 1.2 million people who died from, from COVID. Uh, but certainly there's a great interest in recovering uh, those learning gaps. Uh, the ESSER funds, the GEAR funds uh, provide states with those opportunities. Like other states in Colorado, ESSER funds often go into after school, uh, summer programs. Now we're looking at additional um, after school programming around math to help improve math scores. We did a competitive process through our gear process to address uh, needs, everything from collaborations between community colleges and school districts to mobile learning stations. Uh, higher ed, there's a lot of innovation, and in many ways, the federal policy hasn't caught up with that innovation. Uh, what I urge the committee to look at on Tuesday is really uh, an ROI approach. Yes, sort of the uh, the normal things, loan repayment rates, et cetera, across all kinds of providers, all modality of higher education, not just four-year universities, not just online, not just two-year, for-profit, nonprofit, public, private, uh, all sorts of folks in this space. But how do we, uh, from a federal funding perspective, and I think many of us echo this challenge in the state, how do we treat them all in a way where we fund results, positive results for the individual, meaning earning potential, and for the workforce and economy? And the two are, of course, in sync. Uh, finally, workforce, uh, another uh, hot topic this congressional session here in Washington will be potentially we owe our authorization. Uh, some of the ideas we shared around that include, include increasing flexibility of uh, WIOA funds, even allowing them to be used during the high school years. Uh, we uh, In Colorado, 53% of our graduating high school seniors have successfully I had at least one dual or concurrent enrollment course while they're in high school. So we're really focused on how do our graduating seniors from high school not just graduate with a diploma, but with a certificate, a skill, it could be an associate's degree. We have an entire high school, Colorado, Colorado Early College High School. Every student graduates with an associate's degree, whether it takes four years in high school or five, uh, others with different skills. Uh, but how do we create that space in WIOA for new forms of partnerships with employers, earn while you learn apprenticeship models, uh, career-wise in Colorado um, and active in four or five other states as well uh, has been and pioneering that. And how do we tie that into kind of the uh, workforce approach to WIOA? And, and the other piece being how do we get at, uh, yes, the skills piece, WIOA and, and, and workforce, but there's also real-life barriers that families face to be able to work. They often include things like transportation and childcare. And, and how can we have WIOA and workforce centers be a meaningful partner in what people need to be able to work? It may be skills, or they may have the skills, but there's no place for their two-year-old. Um, and so, or maybe they can't get where they need to go to work. So how do we kind of more broadly figure out from a workforce perspective, how to uh, fill those uh, challenges that we face? 
Um, with that, uh, we have some excellent uh, panelists here. We're, we're also joined by two of our fellow governors, um, and I'll turn it over to Governor Little to introduce the panelists. All right. Uh, thank you, Jared. Uh, first, we have uh, uh, Lydia Logan. She's the Vice President of Global Education and Workforce Development, a little company called IBM, uh, which leads IBM's work on IBM Skills Build, the P-TECH education model, and IBM STEM for Girls. Prior to joining IBM, Ms. Logan led initiatives to provide technology and training to under-resourced schools who work to help low-income families bridge the digital divide. And previous to that, she was vice president and executive director of the Institute for Competitive Workforce at the U.S. Chamber. Ms. Logan. Hello, thank you for having me. Button here. Good afternoon. I'm Lydia Logan, Vice President for Global Education and Workforce Development Programs at IBM. I'd like to thank the National Governors Association for organizing this important discussion today. We are working to expand opportunities for more Americans at IBM, and we have an opportunity to build back a more equitable economy in this post-pandemic time, one that can benefit not just a few, but really most Americans. And as we heard earlier today, we have a challenge facing all of us. This moment um, is a chance to do things differently than we've been doing them before. And that includes this idea of expanding access to well-paying jobs and middle-class careers through learning and through on-the-job training. At IBM, we're committed to investing in the future of work. IBM has a proud legacy of doing this. We have a four-pronged approach that we've taken as a comprehensive ecosystem approach. Through our social impact programs, some of you have known P the P-TECH program an early college high school work connected model that's been around for 10 years, exposes students to work-based learning and the ability to earn an associate's degree while they're in high school. Our newer program, which is Skills Build, is a free global program that, that marries uh, training along with digital credentials. We offer that globally. There are over a thousand learning experiences in it. It's offered in up to 19 languages. Um, we hope that if you haven't gone to skillsbuild.org that you will because any individual can go on, create an account and learn for free. Through our programs at IBM, we are deeply involved in the apprenticeship model starting back in 2017. We have registered apprenticeships for 30 job roles. We've had them reviewed by the American Council on Education, our cybersecurity. We're talking a lot about cybersecurity, not only is it IBM's business, but we believe that this is a critical role to be preparing people to enter the workforce. Comes along with a 45 credit recommendation. And I'll talk a little bit later about the importance in, in integrating and braiding credentials and training. Um, the importance of that is that you should be able to earn and learn on the job, but you also should be able to earn credentials that you can take from your place of work to higher ed and to other uh, training uh, places so that if you're leaving your place of work or leaving your place of, of education, you're not leaving empty handed if you leave without a degree or if you're transitioning from your place of work. So we've got our apprenticeship programs, we have returnships, we've got multiple avenues into IBM. We have eliminated the four-year degree requirement at IBM for 50% of our US jobs. That has allowed us to cast a wider net, get a more diverse applicant pool, and 20% of our US job hires have been people without a four-year degree. Through our advocacy, um, and my colleague, Yelena Weinberg, is here, who's our education and skills lobbyist. We have a skills first coalition. We are looking at new ways to spend existing money, and, and we will have worked closely with the National Governors Association on some of those policies that many of you are putting, many of the governors are putting into place. We know that we need to look beyond our traditional education institutions and new places of training and new ways of thinking about supporting learners the way that they work, to, the way that they learn today. Whether that's learning online, whether it's learning in community colleges, whether it's learning with private institutions, we need to support people to learn when and where and how they learn so that they can be prepared for the jobs that they need. 
through our, our consulting practice, we're looking at infrastructure. We need to make sure that the digital credentials and certifications that people earn are able to be transported securely, that they're able to be verified, and that people can own those credentials for themselves so that they can make sure that they're able to take them to their place of employment, to their university or to other places and have that wallet that's theirs. So we need infrastructure in, in this new place of, in this new world of work that we have, we need to make sure we've got an infrastructure that supports it. We need to look at what are all of the skills that support these new job, the jobs that are developing. How do we have common frameworks? Are we, are we making sure that these systems talk to each other? Interoperable data, and I know we'll get uh, later down the road in this discussion to talk about what kinds of things do we need to invest in. Um, but IBM is either down the road with this or thinking about it and working with many of your states and colleagues on how can we play a part in that? What is it that we as, as employers need to do? And, and what can we make sure that we're doing to, to make sure we're advancing not just what's right for individuals, what's right for society, and what's right for business? We will all need to work together in order to make this work for the country. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, next, we have Sarah Woolworth, who's the, the uh, policy uh, the policy principal at uh, in youth, family, and community development program at the American Institute of Research. Ms. Woolworth leads AIR's Whole Child Learning Development Practice Hub, which houses research, evaluation, technical assistance work uh, to whole child approaches in K-12 education. In addition to this work, Ms. Woolworth currently serves as Deputy Director of the National Center of Safe, Supportive Learning Environments, funded by the Department, U.S. Department of Education's Office of Safe and Supportive School. Ms. Woolworth, thank you for joining us. Thank you, thank you. Thank you, Governor Little, Governor Polis, and NGA for extending this invitation to allow me to speak to you today on behalf of AIR. So AIR is a nonpartisan, not-for-profit institution, and our mission is to generate and use evidence that contributes to a better, more equitable world. In my work at AIR, I work with states primarily to develop, implement, evaluate policies and initiatives that support whole child learning and development. So in thinking about the aims of this task force and of this topic today around helping students succeed today, in classrooms and in their career tomorrow, I had three um, key considerations grounded in evidence that I think I know are critically important for helping K-12 students learn and develop. And they are conditions, competencies, and collaboration. So these are all areas where we've seen significant investments, federal investments um, in terms of funding to states and districts, ESSER, um, the um, Bipartisan Stronger um, excuse me, Bipartisan Safer Communities Act. Um, the first consideration conditions is, you know, what are the conditions that students need to be able to learn anything? So uh, we talk about this at AIR, AIR as conditions for learning. That's what we call them. Um, these are learning environments that are experienced by students as safe, supportive, inclusive, challenging, and caring. So we know from the evidence on how individuals learn and develop that these conditions are truly foundational. Uh, positive conditions for learning are highly valued by students, families, communities. School climate is often, as it's experienced by, by students and educators and families, is often considered a leading indicator of school improvement. As a parent of two young children and a new kindergartner, this is the most important thing to me. This is the most important thing to me. Another important issue that I know this task force is thinking about is teacher retention. And uh, so when we talk about conditions for learning, there's also conditions for teaching. And there's a lot of overlap between the two, climate and relationships, really being at the center, positive relationships, positive school climate. And we know that states are supporting or working to support and build conditions for learning. One major um, area that we see across states and districts is measurement. So climate surveys. I know Colorado has a uh, conditions for teaching and learning survey that, that's administered yearly. We've been working with Nevada for a number of years 
on a school climate survey. They're using ESSER funding to strengthen that, to talk to families and caregivers in addition to um, those that are in the schools. Um, the second consideration is competencies. So you need the conditions to be able to learn, but what are you learning? Uh, what are we focusing on? What are those competencies? And so what I wanna talk about is broadening the focus beyond academic. And I know we're talking also about technical. So academic, technical plus, right? So there's countless frameworks out there that seek to articulate the competencies that students need beyond the academics, beyond the technical. And there are things like teamwork, problem solving, uh, conflict resolution. These are competencies that are important now, and these are competencies that are important in life. I mean, just think about your day to day, all of us, all of our work, how much we use those things. So in schools, they help students engage in learning, persist through challenges, navigate relationships with um, peers and with adults, and they mutually reinforce those conditions. So when we have students and we have teachers that have these competencies, they help to build those supportive, nurturing learning environments that in turn allow us to learn anything. So um, several states and districts have tried to define what those competencies should be. Um, and you know, some places it's referred to as a portrait of a graduate. There's all kinds of different framing, state to state, district to district, but we do hear um, this expansion beyond, beyond academic, beyond technical, including technical, including employability skills um, that, that um, you know, goes beyond here. And so uh, I also want to kind of think back to the panel this morning on, on youth mental health, and we're certainly in the greatest youth mental health crisis this country has ever seen. There's no question about that. And competency development is not the only answer to that. But these competencies do help to build resilience. They help build relationships. Um, when I look at the frameworks, uh, one that always stands out to me is around um, knowing when you need to, when, knowing when you need help and asking for help. So just thinking about how critical that competency is for our youth and for all of us. And then the third consideration is collaboration. Uh, so the mental health needs, that's one example where the K-12 system cannot do it alone. Families cannot do it alone. We need partnership and collaboration and um, due in part to the historic investments and set-asides after school, summer, community schools are really you know, receiving funding, expanding, improving, Community schools um, function as service hubs and they support students, their families, the broader school community in service of whole child development, positive family and community outcomes. And we're seeing promising practices. There's a lot of evidence being gathered around what works in community schools. Um, leading, leading places I would point to are Florida, uh, Chicago and New York City uh, for community schools. And after school and summer play a vital role in the recovery piece, but also in the um, you know getting kids ready for the future side of things. And so we wanna see programs that have academics and enrichment. Um, those conditions are often baked into those programs. They really are places where students can, um, can develop and apply those skills where they have warm, nurturing, positive, supportive learning environments. Uh, in our current work studying summer learning in Texas, we're seeing how the state is working to raise the bar and they're, they're maintaining a focus on academics requiring um, Academics be taught by certified uh, teachers, high quality instructional materials be used, but they're also really um, uh, emphasizing enrichment and, and emphasizing that enrichment is and academics are within a, a warm and welcoming environment. So the fourth, fourth piece of, of within collaboration beyond these would be uh, what we heard this morning around youth, family and community voice and the importance when developing solutions, when understanding challenges that we're talking to, to youth, we're talking to families, we're talking to communities, and, um, and there's no shortage of evidence about challenges, but there's also a lot of strengths to build on at the individual and community and system level. Thank you. So thank you so much. Uh-oh, what was that for? <laughs> we'll have it at the end. Okay, um, so I, I, there's six points I want to make, and I'll try to be fast because I want to make sure that there's time left over for um, 
uh, for discussion. And I'm from New York, so I can't go slow anyway, by the way. So, uh, and, but if I'm going too fast, then just someone say, hey, slow down, slow down. Okay, so I, I wanna go back to Governor Paulus's um, mention of ROI as an organizing principle. So everything I'm gonna talk about is really through the lens of ROI. So when I was at AIR and created College Measures, the discussion of ROI was, was hardly on the table. And over the years, we, I worked with Colorado, I worked with Tennessee, Virginia, uh, Rhode Island, many other states. And, and the organizing principle, all the work we did with College Measures was ROI at the program level. So we, you know, we wear t-shirts or sweatshirts that say University of Colorado or whatever. But what really goes on with regard to ROI is, is program by program. So the programs within universities, within colleges are much more important than actually uh, for almost any college or university as a whole. So one of the things we did with college measures, which then ultimately turned into a, a practice within the college scorecard is to look program by program by program. And, and you need to keep in mind that it's program level outcomes that really matters. We've been able to make a lot of progress on ROI because in fact, we have much better data about wage outcomes. So there's all kinds of problems still with regard to wage outcomes. It's very difficult to work with the IRS and, and I'm very appreciative of the fact that they lock down the, the wage data pretty tightly. Um, but for things like ROI, getting real wage data five, two, five, 10 years after is really important. In states like Colorado, we were using the UI wage data, um, and that was a very useful uh, tool. But there are many, as many of you know, there are shortages, shortcomings with, the, um, with UI wage data in particular in a state like Tennessee, which has seven border states. Um, if, if people go across the border, um, unless there are arrangements between the states, it's extremely difficult to get those data. So, but we have made a lot of progress in understanding that it's program level and, and, and getting wage data. The other thing is that we have made a lot of progress in getting uh, real-time labor market information. And this is, I was working when I was at College Measures, I was working with Burning Glass, which is now has a new name, which I forgot, quite frankly. Um, but Lightcast, I like burning glass. Neither one makes much sense, but okay. So, um, okay. So anyway, so we have, like burning glass has incredibly good information about uh, labor market, real-time labor market information. And uh, the work that we were doing with, um, with, with then burning glass had to do with the identification of skills that were in demand. And, and they get this from scraping job advertisements and, and, and looking at career trajectories. Um, the, the message, one of the key messages is that we can in fact measure regional markets because it, any state has many different regional labor markets and we have to be uh, cognizant of that great variation from one region to the other. And the fact of the matter is that, again, I'm just gonna talk about burn, uh, Lightcast um, data, which, which enabled us to, to look at regional markets and to identify the specific skills that were developing and in short supply, uh, I'm sorry, in high demand in that, in, in that uh, regional labor market. That's point number one. Point number two, community colleges. I mean, I've been in the ed business for some time in community college. When I was at uh, Stony Brook University, at the, at the junior level, we got all these students from Nassau County Community College and Suffolk County Community College showing up. And... Um, and quite frankly, we were not impressed. And that was my fault because the students that were coming in from community colleges had a different set of skills and a different kind of training than a, a, a research university expected. And we were a research university, which meant that we were sitting on a perch and you know, the needs of the community, the needs of society, the needs of the economy were not necessarily number one in our minds. It was not the highest thing. So community colleges are an incredible resource for this country. It's one of the largest areas for, for professional and career training. And the thing that really struck me in all the work that I was doing at College Measures and AIR was the absolute importance and the high ROI for many of their technical and career-oriented certificates. So when we, when College Measures released its first reports for Tennessee and Virginia, we sat there and we said, this can't be, this cannot be because the ROI 
for one certificate program after another, after another, after another, after another, were higher than almost all bachelor degrees coming being granted in the, in the state of Tennessee and, and, and Virginia. And we said, there's something wrong here. This can't possibly be. Again, I come, I come out of a research university, four-year degrees are the thing that matters, right? Graduate education thing, I'll get back to that in a second. Graduate education is the thing that matters. And all of a sudden, boom, 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 one certificate after the other, after the other, after the other, have higher ROI than major, big majors, sorry, big majors in, 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 in universities. So we need to recognize, and I think people have already noted, that career certificates given out by community colleges are incredibly important, and many of them have really high ROI. That's... Um, in contrast, point number three is that one of the largest majors in community colleges are AAs in general studies or liberal arts. So you rem remember community colleges are schizophrenic. Half the campus is in term, you know, is looking at career education and the other half is a liberal arts training ground. The expectation if you go in for an AA in liberal arts is that you're gonna transfer. States are doing remarkably good and trying to improve the thro uh, throughput of students into four-year universities from, uh, from community colleges. But the fact of the matter is that the vast majority of students in two-year AA programs do not transfer, and most of them never end up with their degree. So we have one of the largest programs in community colleges, the AA in general studies or liberal arts. 350,000 graduates a couple of years ago in AA, and the wage return for those students is abysmal. It's abysmal because they're getting a mini general arts education without coming out with a skill set that is marketable. This to me is a, um, well, I'm, it's, Okay, I have to be careful because I'm a high-level government official. It's 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 not acceptable. <laughs> well, thank you for reminding me. <laughs> but it is, uh, but it is, un it is, it, it's not acceptable. And states actually, if you look at the ROI, states should be looking at this much more carefully. The fourth point: we have little information about non-credit activity, right? which is totally crazy because so much of uh, the enrollment activity in community colleges is non-credit. And, and increasingly, we're granting non-credit certificates for, for jobs, right? So I might, go into, I might go into a community college and take three credits in auto mechanic repair or whatever. I get some kind of certificate. So th th those numbers are growing and growing and growing. We have no, we, we, IES, we run iPads, we have no capacity to gather that information and then to link it to wage data. Um, and there's lots of reasons for that. Uh, but the fact of the matter is I'm trying to do some deals with some states to try to get their wage data linked to their count of certificate programs, non-credit certificate programs, so we could do ROI for that. Um, Colorado, I hope we, we could uh, recruit you into our uh, our growing uh, um, network. This, the fifth point is master's degrees. So, I mean, you, you you hear like masters of the new bachelor's degree. Well, that is true in the sense that many of them have terrible ROI, right? And we need to be and we need to be very careful of that because we keep sending people into master's degrees. A bachelor's no longer good enough. Now you need a master's degree. At the same time, of course, we say four-year degrees are, are gone, right? We don't need them anymore. So there's, a, again, there's like a whole schizophrenia out there. But the fact of the matter is that if you look at the ROI for masters, for many master's programs, they're worse, they're worse than community college. I mean, think about that, right? So we tell people you need master's degrees uh, because it's a new bachelor's, you need to get a degree that's, that distinguishes you from everybody else. And then you have a, an ROI that's worse, worse, then often all associate degrees and certainly the, the you know, the, the certificates that are uh, career oriented. And the last point is that we could talk about ROI. We could compute ROI with a great de degree of certainty. The hardest thing in all the years I was running college measures and doing work with one state after the other, the hardest thing I've ever done and failed at 
was trying to master, I'm going to call it retail politics of the ROI. So we can compute this with a great deal of, of certainty, but we're pushing against a very big rock on a very steep hill that we're, oh, you know, you need a bachelor's degree. How do we get this information? We could compute it. We could turn out reports. I work with the Chamber of Commerce. I work with, uh, I mean, newspapers, everybody trying to get the ROI into people's heads. And it was, it was almost impossible. So I know that the default is, well, if, if we know this and we can't get people to behave in the way we want them to behave, let's regulate, right? And I mean, that's one approach, but we also ultimately need to figure out a much better strategy for communicating this, this information that we're getting to people so they can make much better choices. Thank you. You're supposed to give us the answers, not the questions. <laughs> I uh, uh, well, actually, both of you, uh, and and we talked a little bit about this before. So, uh, so Jared's got to hire somebody, and uh, he's got his choice between uh, Brad, who's got a bachelor's degree, and he can call up the University of Idaho and verify that I had it, or not like George Santos. I, I, no, <laughs> That's our secret. Uh, but or, or Tina, who's got like three incredible certificates, so. He calls the University of Idaho and looks at my transcript, goes, it's not great, but you did get a degree. Uh, but how does where does he look to find the certificate? Who's gonna be who's gonna be the keeper of that data? Like and, the, and the qualitative you're saying. Yeah, did exactly. they do really well in a certificate program or did they barely make it through? Well, well I, I just got a degree. I didn't I'm, I'm not gonna give you my transcript. <laughs> so. So I, I think we're witnessing a major shift away from degrees towards skills and competencies. I, I, I think that's the bottom line on this. And what we really need is, so for me, the, the, the advantage of labor market outcome data is that it's in dollars, it's measurable. It, schools can't manipulate it. Schools can't you know mess with it. It's, it's an objective indicator measured by either UI or IRS. So we have an objective indicator that says this program is good. People coming out of it have good career lines. Of course, there's individual variation, and and we got to figure that one out. Um, but the the movement to skills and competencies is for real, and and I applaud it. And, and I think we could begin to identify um, the skills that are in demand. And again, it's regional, it's state, but also regional. And and then the challenge, I believe is to try to get schools, especially regional campuses or community colleges, to change their curricula to emphasize those skills, right? So we don't have to get rid of the liberal arts AA degree. What we have to make sure of is that students in that degree program understand, understand that they're probably not going to get a bachelor's degree, but they have to be able to walk out of that program with a set of skills that are in demand. And we could we could actually identify those skills, and but then the question is how do we communicate that information? So if I may, we, we are working with um, with the cybersecurity leadership centers that we are establishing with twenty HBCUs. Many of the professors who are deans of computer science have aligned the credentials that we offer through Skills Build with the competency frameworks that are beneath those credentials with the courses that the students are taking. And so what they've done is to embed earning the credentials into the coursework. So students are earning the credential while they're taking the courses. So they're doing both at the same time. They're earning, they're on their path to a degree while they also are earning credentials along the way. Now we have frameworks behind our credentials and if you wanna know what they are, you can see them. And a quality credential will have a framework and, and that's, visible to anyone who wants to see it. If if it if there is no framework and competency behind it, there's a problem. <laughs> so that's step one. But it, the the two, a degree pathway and a credential don't need to be divorced from one another. Now, to Mark's point, you know, whether they're credit bearing or not, that's a different question. I don't think they have to be credit bearing. I think it's great if they are, because then a student who decides to or for whatever reason, has to step out of their degree pathway and still has some credits that come along with that credential, that's a great benefit for the student. If they earn a, earn a credential that is worth a few college credits, that's great. That, that stays with them and with that credential. 
Um, but the, the idea of frameworks and competencies that undergird a credential is really important. If you earn it with, you know, from a, from a training provider that is, you, they can't prove what it is that you know and are able to do that, that is represented by that credential, that is a problem. That's a quality issue. And I think, you know, as training programs grow and people are issuing credentials, we need to be tough on quality. And that's part of it. I, the only thing I'd follow up is who's we, I, you know, for, for an institution uh, uh, that gives a degree, there's, we've got, uh, you know, a hundred years of accreditation by, uh, you know, every university and community college is accredited. This is such a new area is we IBM or is we uh, the U S who, who's going to, who's going to decide what we is if Jared, the employer wants to check out, uh, Tina's credentials. Who's going to hold that? We stand behind ours. <laughs> <laughs> I assume LinkedIn solves that for us. Um, no, but seriously, I'm like, who's going to go look at the? I'm like, does anybody actually look at a transcript? Hmm. Some people do. Some do. Okay. Yeah. Some do. So I, 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 you mentioned accreditation, which of course is a key to you, you if you're not accredited you can't get title for money therefore you need to be accredited and if you lose your accreditation you're, you're, you're in trouble um but we but the accreditation system is also a historical creation and some of some of the regional accreditors are taking much more seriously the outcomes and, and student success and i and i think it's incumbent upon us to push that message and have accreditors uh focus on on that so uh, first, uh, I wanted to mention, you know, uh, Ms. Logan mentioned uh, P-TECH. We actually, Colorado, our first P-TECH high school was a collaboration with IBM. They were the industry partner, St. Fragan School District, uh, about 10 years now. And originally, some of the startup funds were from the uh, Race to the Comp, Race to the Top competition under uh, President Obama. We also have uh, moved to skills-based hiring as a state. Uh, so we are at about 70%. I think our goal is 90%. Uh, we don't post for degree requirements or anything like that. The, the ones we do are, you know, the things where if you need to be a CPA, you need to be CPA. If you need to be an attorney, you need to be an attorney, but JD, but um, generally we moved away from that because there's lots of ways that people get experience. And I would just add to this formal certificate, there's also informal ways people get experience, which all the challenges we have on on credentialing, the, the formal ways are even harder. But that means, you know, you could you could get it through having your own business, as a homemaker, talk about a good organizer and manager. Let's say you raised six kids, my goodness, U.S. military, um, lots of ways that people get skills. Uh, and uh, we have some of those same challenges around those as well. But um, my, my question is, Dr. Schneider, anybody else who wants to address it is we've talked about kind of how we don't have any of this, this data. You know, uh, IBM sort of vouches for their own, you know, credentials and quality. But how do you get this kind of how do you make it more open source where there's kind of this this marketplace of uh, accountability where, you know, people can look at whether IBM's credentials are, are worth anything or not, um, not just from their say so or their own internal HR, but from the external validation measures of ROI and how their how their recipients are doing three years out, five years out. So what barriers exist to this data across different credentialing programs and then also pulling in kind of the informal ways that people gain skills and how we can look at that from a data perspective as well. So, um, so I, I just want to talk about non-credit activity first, because this is uh, in a community college, probably half of the enrollment activity is in non-credit activity. We also know that there are increasing numbers of certificates coming out of no, based on non-credit. And I, I think Lydia is correct. If if we, in some ideal world, th these would be credit bearing, but it's not an ideal world. And we have, we don't even know how many students are getting, or learners are getting these uh, non-credit certificates. We don't even know how much activity is going on in the non-credit world of community colleges. I will tell you that we asked uh, OMB to allow iPads to get information about non-credit activity. And we were told that we could not do that, uh, do this as a mandatory requirement because iPads rest on Title IV and non-credit activity right now is not Title IV uh, uh, supported. 
so therefore, we were told that we could do a voluntary uh, 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 data collection via iPads, but not a mandatory. So one. really quick follow. So you're saying if federal Title IV was extended to these kinds of uh, non-degree programs, so would the flow of information back about the accountability of these programs? Correct. And, and of course, short-term Pell is going to be, uh, if, if that gets enacted, then we will have a better leg to stand on with regard to making these kinds of data collections um, through iPads uh, mandatory. That's number one. Number two, the states have these data in, in, and, they, and they're often pretty good data because community colleges get funded on the basis of enrollment activities. So they need to keep track of this. They report it to the states, often reported, not all the time, reported to the states. And then there's the question of whether or not the states are collecting the kinds of detailed information about uh, non-credit certificates. The, this, the flip side of that, the other side of that coin is like the wage outcomes. So again, ideally, we could imagine like federal sources like IRS data or the uh, directory of new hires. All of these data are there, right? They're hard to access. And again, I, uh, you know, the IRS, we want that data locked up, but we also need, so when, when we think about privacy and data, we often only talk about the risks, but never the benefits. A sophisticated discussion about, about risk and privacy has to be balancing the risks versus the rewards. And different people just tend to say, oh no, it's the risk, the risk, the risk. But, but again, we need to start thinking about the balance between risks and rewards. In the meantime, states have the UI wage data and they can in fact, and, and, and many states have incredibly long records of people's careers and how much money they made. So then the question is, could we liberate those data and tie it to, for example, the uh, um, non-credit certificates? The answer is we can do it. We haven't done it, but we can and we should. Thank you. Um, yeah, I was gonna say, let's go to our fellow governors, Governor McKee, Governor Kotek, questions for our panel. Governor McKee. A, a topic that I'm certainly concerned about and very interested in. So thank you to the panelists and uh, the governors that are leading the charge, a, a newly elected four-year term, although I came in on the heels of uh, Governor Raimondo going to Secretary of Commerce. And um, so Rhode Island uh, is in a spot where we are doing budgets and investing in the pre-K and investing all the way up to uh, getting uh, certificate degrees that have been started but not completed. I was at the Community College of Rhode Island this week with about 20 individuals who have done exactly what you're talking about mm -hmm. came in and now they're they've upgraded their degree or upgraded their um certificate and now you know they're moving into uh higher paying jobs and and jobs that they're going to be a whole lot more happy about um as a former mayor i did start uh mayor-led public schools charter schools um that um will grow to probably about 8,000 students uh, in our state, which is a relatively small state. So it's having a certainly an impact on that and regionally uh, developing. As governor, I get to do some things on budgets that are um, should be able to be a help, right? And certainly going to be going to the Department of Education for, for more input. But uh, so we are starting a strategy in town, and which, uh, you know, when you're talking about, uh, you know, in and out of school type of strategies, but we're going to start this 365 day um, strategy that says that education in every household in the state of Rhode Island is a is a is a priority, both on you know things that have to do with mental health as well as academic recovery. Uh, and uh, as I did when I started the schools that uh, have those 8,000 students, in, and by the way, closing gaps on the peers by 20 to 25 points on reading and math outcomes. Uh, and in, and mostly into high need type of economic type of driven circumstances. So, but we are doing the same thing. So we're starting a nonprofit again, just like I did when I started off the mayoral academies uh, to connect inside school, outside school, and outside school, and with inside school on a 365 day uh, type of time frame. Uh, so being here, just kind of sitting back and trying to listen in I, you know people in the audience are interested in this type of thing love to follow up on ibm with some of the things that you've talked about with um 
helping some of the uh, cyber cybersecurity issues and those type of things. But so yeah, we're we're ready to launch this uh, in a way that I think is going to be pretty powerful for Rhode Island. Uh, could be for other states, but also trying to hear about. I know that uh, Governor Paulus has many things that have been happening in Colorado over the years on education. So we we draw from one another. But that's that's kind of where we are right now as a state. So uh, looking forward to um, to working with the NGA and um, and the partners that are here. Any of our panelists want to comment on Governor McKee? I mean, the other thing I'd say is there are many job roles, particularly at the entry level, where the skill sets that are that undergird those roles are pretty standard across um, across companies. So, for instance, an entry level data analyst job is would be pretty much the same at IBM, at Microsoft, at Amazon. We all talk about what those job roles are. We have you know, we're issuing credentials. Our our peer companies issue similar credentials. Those certifications are pretty much comparable. And so there is somewhat of an informal standardization. There's not a formal standardization. I think what the the market hasn't matured to a point where there is no oversight, right? And so I don't think we would advocate for that, but there has to be some sort of a system. So the question is, what you know, what will the system be? I vote I. Right. <laughs> Governor Kotek. But the, but oh, to Mark's sorry. point, there needs to be right data. Mm -hmm. We are fans of data, the fans of making sure that we're looking at ROI, that it's interoperable, that it works for individuals, that it works for society, that it works for business that we're making smart investments, that it works, right? The taxpayer dollars are being used in a way that, that's smart, that the system of training that we have is gonna be responsive to market needs mm -hmm. in a timely way. So it, it's gotta be a system that is taking all of those things into consideration. In the meantime, we're stepping in and doing what needs to be done in order to make sure that we can find the talent we need. We're casting a wide net, we're developing training that's that's to our quality standard, and we're issuing the credentials to people we know can do the work and can demonstrate that they know and are able to do the jobs that are available. Governor Kotek. Thank you, Governor. So um, this is a really interesting conversation, giving me a lot to think about. Um, I'm a big fan of community colleges. I think they are the linchpin of our workforce issues, just you know, career trajectory for folks. Um, the, you know, in Oregon, we have independent institutions. We're not well resourced by the state and not well resourced locally. And I think they're trying to do everything for everybody. When you have half of the folks who go to community colleges seeing it as a pathway to a four year degree, and I, I will go back and have a conversation about nothing is worse than someone spending time and money and energy to get something that doesn't get them to the next step. But I think our community colleges, particularly in Oregon, have said, okay, we're being told to help prepare students for four-year degrees. So we want to be available for that. I think they're making up for deficiencies in our K-12 system and more so every year for the programs that, because theoretically, a student should come out of a high school without having to take those classes and go right in. Now, there's a price thing, right? A lot of students will do the two-year path because that makes their four-year so that's the affordability issue that is, is pushing folks through this path, but they need to get to the next step. So that's a, an excellent point. When we talk about how students actually learn about these things, how many schools are actually sitting down with a person before they decide to take a course, credit or non-credit, and have a conversation about what they want to do? Because this ROI, ROI conversation is fine, and I'm all for collecting data. I'm not sure people start things with that in mind. I think we have this idea that everyone comes and prepare because I want to get a good job. Now, that's true in a lot of cases, but that doesn't mean they know where they want to go. So if we're not having those initial conversations with people, they're not making the best informed choices. So how do we deal with that? Um, and then the last point, it's really great to have the private sector, this credentialing, particularly in the, in the tech sector, is super exciting. And I would hope that we don't go too far in trying to figure out who's got the best program and a, a whole nother accreditation for this private sector credentialing. 
but we do have to have some standards, right? Because what I would worry about is um, people think it's going to produce something for them, particularly if they're paying for it. I assume your program is free. It's free. It's free. Well, that's a plus, right? Because I do think people will step into that space and say, come take my very expensive 12 week program to get a a lot of potential, (laughs) which doesn't mean anything, right? And so we want to avoid that. So, um, but it'd be great to, you know, how do we transform our community colleges to move to this next step? They are really caught in between here. Are they to your degree producing institutions to get people to four-year degrees or do we want them to be something else? It's great that it would be nice if they overlapped, but I can tell you our schools don't have the resources to do everything. And so I think they're trying to figure out and some money to help them transform differently, I think would be really helpful. So the so before I took this job, I was at AIR and running college measures. And my plan, which is now in abeyance, was to work with community colleges to identify, use real-time labor market information to identify the skills in the regional market that that community college um, um, serves, because almost all those students are, they're not packing up and going to Princeton from, right, they're staying in the, in that community. Um, so if we could identify the skills that are needed in that county, for example, then the task, and, and, and there was a business opportunity there for me, that was way I was looking at it, the task is to work with community colleges to identify those skills and build them into, in, in particular because of the AA in liberal arts, figure out how to build those skills into that curriculum because so many students are in that curriculum with the goal of going to a four-year school and getting a bachelor's degree and so many of them don't do it. So we want them to have skills when they come out, they could, because most of them won't end up in a four-year school or, or not succeed, they have to have marketable skills from that degree program. And the skills often, and, and Lydia could talk to this, they often aren't very high level, right? They're, I mean, some of them are pretty basic skills that people need to be able to get jobs in the in the local job market. Well, I would add, in addition to the technical skills that we offer, we also have ways of working like agile, project management, collaboration, presentation skills. We have partners like Adobe, who are our clients that we've got, you know, aligned to the um, Tenth night for most states, their ninth and tenth grade standards around public speaking and presentations, content that we did with Adobe. So it's not all about cybersecurity and AI and you know uh, cloud computing, but what do you need to be successful in a place of work? And a lot of those are the skills that keep you from being successful, even if you have the technical skills. Exactly. So you need to have both. You were post. Yeah, are we doing concluding now, or we have? Yep. Okay, I think I would, we did a great discussion. I I like the way Governor, you know, Kotech brought up something that's lost in all this. How do we help somebody sort of find their passion and a career they actually want to stick with? It's it's the numbers are great, but it's also about you know what somebody wants to do with their lives. So um, um, economics plays a role in that, but it's obviously more than economics uh, as well. It's um, uh, matching somebody with uh, who has the, uh, the the passion or desire for doing something with the skills to be able to do it. Um, Very thought-provoking panel. I'm really glad that this is in the forefront of uh, all of our minds, both the last panel as well as this panel, uh, strengthening our education. And of course, uh, with several exclamation points uh, for a real-life challenge governors face today, strengthening our workforce, a priority, something we hear from uh, nearly every business in our state uh, and is uh, is making it even more challenging. you know, during my state of the state before the state legislature a few weeks ago, I uh, did a uh, uh, an imitation of Yoda from Star Wars. I'm not going to do that again, <laughs> but I was going to say that Luke Skywalker wasn't born knowing the ways of the Force. He was trained under Yoda in a non-degree program. So <laughs> um, I'm really proud of the work Colorado uh, has done, is doing to support people with the services they need, um, expanding access uh, breaking down barriers to to employment to expand the workforce and of course a lot of the discussion here bridging that skills gap that also exists um, these opportunities will help really support uh an america that thrives uh, and we have lessons for each of our states to take back and i want to thank our panelists i want to thank governor kotek and governor mcgee and governor little for the thoughtful conversation uh the collaborative effort to support our students uh to power our country's economy and I'll turn it back over to Governor Little to close it off. Well, thanks, Jared. I uh, uh, just so you know, Idaho's a very conservative state, and I only own one necktie. 
<laughs> I, uh, uh, well, you know, it's interesting because like I said, my biggest initiative is our in-demands job to where every student with a, that graduates from high school has got a pathway. Uh, and my workforce development the council is going to make the recommendations about what are those in-demand jobs. If you're an employer and there's only one job in the state of Idaho, that's in demand. And that's the issue. But collectively, how do we point our career technical colleges, our community colleges, and even our four-year institutions in the right direction and get those signals going back and forth in such a fast, fast moving economy? That you know, our our four-year institutions we all know are slower than our community colleges and our career technical are faster, but you know, everybody's got a bias. Anybody up here not have a bachelor's degree? And all my educators have a bachelor's degree. <laughs> okay. well, and, and so that bias is there and we all need to be cognizant of that bias that exists in the classroom where we're trying to tell our seventh and eighth graders, you can have a great career in career technical and and go on and then have that training in place but the national governors Association, as you've seen all day long is a great great venue to have these discussions i don't think everybody's got it figured out just perfect but we are starting to ask the right questions and i appreciate everybody's participation thank you very much thank you